His teeth were knocked out. His penis was burned, bruised, and cut. He was being starved to death. He was being beaten. Wasn't allowed outside. Had no toys, no friends. He was being belittled and bullied. Gabriel's last vision was that man over there, standing over Gabriel, beating him to death. Hatami detailed out the disturbing acts allegedly committed by the Palmdale couple, how they beat Gabriel, bit him, burned him with cigarettes, whipped him, shot him with a BB gun, starved him, fed him cat litter, and kept him gagged and bound in this cubby. As for a motive, that Aguirre just didn't like Gabriel and thought he was gay. The evidence will show that the defendant's nothing more than a bully. He was a security guard who intentionally tortured and abused a helpless and innocent little boy. LAFD paramedic James Cermak, the first witness on the stand, said he couldn't believe what he saw when he responded to the 911 call of Gabriel in cardiac arrest at a Palmdale apartment back on May 22, 2013. The more you looked, the more you saw it. It's just, it, it was just unbelievable the amount of trauma on, on his body. Defense attorney John Allen says his client admits to causing the injuries, but that it only happened because the sorrow exploded in rage after Gabriel told his mom to leave her boyfriend. That his sorrow has a very hard time handling stressful, chaotic situations. He is guilty of murder, but the special circumstance alleged that he intended to kill Gabriel through the inflation of torture is not true. This is day two. Now, the prosecution really painting a picture with the eight year old's injuries, his two front teeth forcibly removed, ribs that were fractured, burns all over his body, strangulation marks, as well as skull fractures. The jury, many of them not even able to look at these pictures anymore, but the prosecution relentless in trying to prove that Gabriel's murder was intentional. Strangulation marks around his neck, his ankles were swollen. Uh, I believe his uh, left palm uh, looked like it was burned, bite marks, bruises, head to toe, uh, skull fractures. Every inch of Gabriel was bruised and swollen. Um, his skin was kind of a black and blue mottled color. I remember he felt cold to the touch. His cigarette burns on his body, been bruising throughout his entire body, and it looked like uh, his penis, uh, had somebody attempted to cut it off. And you testify that pretty much every inch of Gabriel's body was covered in injuries. Is that correct? Correct. An overflow crowd in court today to hear firsthand from an emergency room nurse who treated young Gabriel when he was taken to the hospital after being beaten unconscious. These are multiple injuries um, uh, of of different types. There were abrasions, there were open wounds, there was bruising, there was swelling, there was marks on the legs, there was skin missing off the top of the neck. I felt terrible. I've never seen anything in my, in, in my entire career. I've never seen anything like that. I wasn't prepared. I was speechless. I Today in testimony, his grandfather said that he and his wife, the grandmother, had this little boy in their custody for almost eight years. And then mom came, his daughter, and said, I want him back. Okay. Robert Fernandez told the court today that listening to that 911 tape, hearing the voice of his late wife, and knowing that they were talking about his eight-year-old grandson, Gabriel Fernandez, was just too much. Because he had swore that he was going to bring Gabriel back, and he did it. He was talking about the defendant in this case, Isaro Aguirre. Fernandez told the court that he and his late wife, who died of complications from diabetes eight months after Gabriel died in May of 2013, had raised Gabriel for nearly eight years. They thought they had complete custody of him. Thought they did. And the deputy said no. Uh, I don't know what he started talking about. We had to go to court. To he was talking about the night deputy sheriffs went to his house and told him and his wife that they could not get Gabriel back. His daughter and her boyfriend had taken Gabriel and they wanted him back. And they were told that the document that Pearl Fernandez had signed relinquishing custody was not valid and that the mother 
was entitled to have her son back. That she had the legal right to revoke that at any time. Sheriff's Detective David Nissenhoff, who was there that night, explained to the jury what he told the grandparents, that they could not keep Gabriel. Gabriel then moved in with his mother and her boyfriend, and Fernandez said he saw very little of him over the next eight months, two or three times at the most because his daughter wouldn't allow it. And then he said he made a promise to Gabriel. One of these days, spring, let him come home. And I promise, I promise that to him. Secretly recorded in the Antelope Valley Jail, Pro Fernandez demanding answers from defendant Isaura Aguirre. She has seen the autopsy of her eight-year-old son, Gabriel. He suffered from a brain concussion, like it was cracked. And I'm going to call it from cardiac, cardiac arrest. Her questions, not about how it happened, but how much Aguirre had spilled to detectives. Do you know why they got that murder charge on me? Because you said I was inside the room. No squabbling, no expressions of sorrow. According to prosecutors, it's another reason Aguirre should be put to death. No cameras allowed in the court today as the older brother of Gabriel Fernandez took the stand. He's now 16 and was identified only as Ezekiel. He was shown the cabinet that Gabriel was forced to sleep in night after night. He called it the box. Question. Do you remember seeing the defendant and your mom put Gabriel in the box? Yes. They would put handcuffs on the door to the box. What else? They would wrap a bandana around his mouth. Sometimes they would put a sock in his mouth. He told the jury about the beatings Aguirre would give his little brother with a belt. My mom's boyfriend hit him with a belt, he said, the metal part. Where? In the arms, legs, back. Sometimes he used a metal hanger. How often? A lot. He then said, one time Aguirre hit him with a bat. I saw his teeth get knocked out. I saw lots of blood. And he told the jury how he saw Aguirre shoot his little brother over and over with a BB gun. Question, did you see the defendant shoot Gabriel? Yes. Where? In his legs and arms. What would Gabriel do? Scream and cry. Where else did the defendant shoot Gabriel? In the groin. During his entire testimony, Ezekiel, who was 12 years old when he witnessed all this, never once looked over at his mother's boyfriend. He said he's trying to forget what he saw. And then he told the jury, quote, the defendant ruined my life. I want to get past it. My mom and her boyfriend made Gabriel eat spoiled stuff or expired stuff. One thing I remember is expired spinach. He threw it up and they made him eat it off the table. The prosecutor asks, did the defendant make him eat throw up? Ezekiel answers yes. Ezekiel said Aguirre and his mom threatened him with the same abuse if he told anyone or did anything to stop them and said Aguirre and his mom told him to lie about Gabriel's injuries saying they happened while he was playing. Ezekiel testified that Gabriel was not given any toys and not allowed to play with friends. Ezekiel also said he didn't know why Gabriel was beaten, abused and treated differently. Throughout the 16-year-old's testimony, Azaria Aguirre remained stone-faced and motionless. On the day Gabriel died, Ezekiel said he saw his mother and Aguirre hitting Gabriel until he was bleeding and then dragging the boy into their room and closing the door. Ezekiel said he heard screams and bangs and then everything went quiet. The prosecution played for the court the recorded interviews of defendant Osario Aguirre, also known as Tony, conducted by sheriff's detectives in the hours after Gabriel was rushed to the hospital. So exactly what happened? And what did you hit him over the head with? Your fist. How many times? Maybe ten times. With your fist to the head. In the recordings, Aguirre describes how Gabriel made him mad, saying the eight-year-old told his mother Pearl that she should leave Aguirre. In the recordings, Aguirre states that he lost control, even admitting that he hit Gabriel harder than he has ever hit anyone before. So you pick it back up and you hit him again. Okay. How many times did you do that? You had to him down and pick him up. Aguirre admits at one point losing count. In their cross-examination, the defense played the video recording of Aguirre's interview with detectives. Aguirre describes trying to revive the eight-year-old when he stopped breathing. When I took about, actually, you know, bubbles or air bubbles in his nose. So I told him, you know, give me the phone, so I found one, and she did. 
The prosecution, however, fought back in their redirect. Even based on that last interview, did you believe the defendant was telling the whole truth about everything that he did? No. Criminalist Tiffany Hsu described while the jury looked at photo after photo of blood stains and indentation marks on the walls. The yellow arrows indicate blood stains that I had tested. They tested positive for blood. You previously used red. Why did you use yellow here? I changed to yellow because I ran out of red stickers. Shu did DNA tests on items in the home with blood on them, including a wooden club, a black bat, and a data cord. She says his DNA was also found right. inside the cabinet. Prosecutors say Gabriel was locked in for hours with no food or water or access to the bathroom, bound and gagged. The red sticker arrows indicate red brown stains that I had tested for blood. They were positive for blood. On cross-examination, Shu told the jury a blue bandana and socks that may have been used to gag the boy did not contain his saliva. The last witness on the stand, Stephen Schliebe, the now-retired criminalist, testified his job was to compare a cat litter sample to the contents of Gabriel's stomach under a microscope. And that same material was also what composed the gray particles uh, from the stomach contents. So they were similar? Yes, I could not tell them apart. This tells me that Gabriel's uh, rib cage has been uh, struck by blunt force multiple times from multiple different directions over a period of weeks. On the stand today, Gabriel's first grade teacher, she spent the most time with Gabriel and said that he opened up to her about the abuse he was experiencing at home. Written in the shaky, unsure handwriting of a first grader, Gabriel's teacher reads a note she found hidden in the eight-year-old's desk a few days after she learned of his brutal death. I love you, Mom, and Gabriel is a good boy. Jennifer Garcia said Gabriel confided in her early on in the school year, telling her he was beaten at home. Garcia immediately reported this to the Department of Children and Family Services. She said, well, sometimes my mom makes me bleed. And I said, well, where do you bleed? And he said, well, on my body. Over the next few months, Garcia said she saw repeated bruises, burns, wounds, and other injuries on the boy, and said in at least one instance, Gabriel came to school wearing girls' clothes. Defendant Asario Aguirre remained emotionless with his eyes on the table in front of him as Garcia described seeing Gabriel become more withdrawn and lash out in anger when questioned about his injuries. Are you sure? That that's what really happened and then he did eventually tell me and he was like really angry and he you know he said well it's because my mom shot me in the face with a bb gun garcia said she called dcfs multiple times and then realized gabriel was suffering more abuse because of it a metal baton and wooden bats Aguirre's trial revealed that gabriel would be beaten anytime social workers would ask questions about his injuries i didn't want to call i didn't know what to do I don't know, I could look at his face and, you know, not be able to assure him that that wasn't going to happen again when I couldn't say that. When Gabriel was absent for several days, Garcia was told he had been sent to live with family in Texas. The teacher hoped this was true. Roughly a week later, Gabriel was dead. Today, the prosecution rested its case against Aguirre, closing with a detective who listed all the items Aguirre allegedly used to hurt the boy along with a bat and a club. Two pairs of handcuffs were recovered. Yes. Um, some metal BBs that were in a plastic container that was recovered. Yes. BBs, which were found embedded in the child's body. Nine metal pellets in his neck, face, lung, legs, buttocks, foot, chest, and groin. Earlier, the jurors heard Aguirre in his own words, calling 911, explaining that Gabriel fell unconscious while playing with his brother. That call came after Aguirre said he had first tried first aid, spraying Gabriel with water. He said he's unconscious, so I took him to the shower, put cold water, and right now I, I took him up and he didn't know. She found a BB that was lodged in, in his foot. After a parade of witnesses told the jury about the torture and the bruises and injuries they found on the body of eight-year-old Gabriel Fernandez, after his grandfather wept on the stand, it was the defense's turn to put up their case.
The jury saw a video of 37-year-old Isaro Aguirre, the defendant, crying when he was being questioned the night that Gabriel died. The defense claims that during this interview, Aguirre kept asking detectives, how's Gabriel doing? Can I go see him at the hospital? He kept asking that over and over again. The defense contends that this is important because it shows that Aguirre cared for the little boy. Sure, they claim, he did beat up Gabriel. He did hit him. He did kick him. But he never meant for Gabriel to die. That's what Aguirre's attorney told the jury during opening statements, that Aguirre did commit murder. But he also told the jury that the special circumstance of torture, which could lead to the death penalty, does not apply here because Aguirre did not intend for Gabriel to die. According to sources, right after Aguirre was arrested, he told detectives it was all Miss Fernandez. She was the one that tortured eight-year-old Gabriel, not him. Today, the defense called the paternal grandparents of the eight-year-old victim. The couple in Texas had no knowledge of Gabriel's abuse, but they did know how his mother, Pearl, treated another son, Arnold, testifying that Pearl didn't want the four-year-old, so she gave him away. She told us that she did not love Arnold because she suffered so much during his delivery that she did not love him. Through an interpreter, Rodrigo Contreras said they never saw Pearl hit any of her children, but he and his wife saw signs. I saw a couple of times <coughs> a couple of bruises on Arnold. Four witnesses standing by this morning to testify that Aguirre had difficulty with simple tasks when he worked at a McDonald's, that he was easily duped, that he was a D student who failed the ninth grade and later dropped out. The court disallowed those witnesses because the defense had no expert to testify that Aguirre's slowness was a factor in how he treated Gabriel. The judge admonished the defense. The lawyers had three years to find such an expert and didn't. No more witnesses, no hearing until Monday when the defense is expected to rest and the jury will hear closing arguments. There is evil in this room right now. And it's right over there. A bandana was over his face. His ankles were handcuffed. That was old and new uh, hematoma. Bleeding in the brain caused from blunt force trauma. His hair was actually physically removed or pulled out of his head. He was belittled, bullied, and called gay. His teeth were knocked out. Gabriel was dying. They were killing him. That's intentional murder by torture. The defendant actually liked torturing Gabriel. He got off on it. He got off on it. And when you think about all the evidence, I know it's hard to believe that. It is hard to believe that, but he did. The defendant took everything from him. Everything. And the last thing he saw was the defendant standing over him, punching him, kicking him, calling him gay, beating him to death. Hold him responsible. It ends here. It ends now with you, the people. A decision to kill made rashly, impulsively, or without careful consideration is not deliberate and premeditated. Guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. We further find the allegation that said murder was committed intentionally and involved the infliction of torture. Isaro Aguirre, now a convicted man facing the possibility of the death penalty, never made a move, never looked anywhere but straight ahead, never flinched, never shed a tear. It was during the trial that uh, evidence came out that every time Gabriel was beaten, they kept saying that you're no good, you're not worth living, you're a bad boy. That's the note, I'm a good boy. What happens next? Uh, they take a break, same jury, seven women, five men. They now begin what is called the penalty phase. It caught me really off guard was that just the way he was being held. Veteran paramedics shocked, first seeing the head-to-toe injuries on eight-year-old Gabriel Fernandez. I've never seen it. I've never seen a kid that was that, um, that abused. Then how little the defendant, Isaro Aguirre, seemed to care, the way Aguirre handed him over to first responders. Like he didn't want any part of it, like, like away from his body and his body was flailed back and his head was flailed, flailed back and arms were, were wide open. And it didn't have to happen, says the prosecutor, showing these pictures. Then the betrayal, the jury viewing a note Gabriel left behind. I love you, Mom. 
Gabriel is a good boy. What Aguirre deserves now, says the prosecutor. The only just and appropriate penalty that this defendant should receive is nothing less than death. Aguirre's defense tells the jury, consider Aguirre's whole life, that he was mentally slow, easily manipulated, and had no history of violence until he moved in with Gabriel's mother, that she's combative even now. Including an assault on a custodial officer, resulting in the filing of felony criminal charges by the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office and a separate incident where she fought with another female inmate. Gabriel's father was in the courtroom today. He stormed out when some of the grisly photos of his son were on display. He will be back tomorrow to take the witness stand. Arnold Contreras testifies that the death of his son changed his life and the lives of Gabriel's siblings. The family will never be seen. Everybody was affected by it. Contreras says he is racked with guilt. He was serving time, unable to watch over his son. Oh, I should have been there. Had he been able, he would have stopped Gabriel's mother, Pearl Fernandez, and her boyfriend, Isauro Aguirre, from taking Gabriel from the grandparents who adored him. Pearl never showed any type of love towards you. Isauro's life is now in your hands, ladies and gentlemen. And I am pleading for his life. The defense making its final plea for Isauro Aguirre. If Isauro is sentenced to death, this family will be devastated. Urging the jury to see more than just Aguirre's abuse and murder of Gabriel, the defense describes Aguirre's work at an elderly home and insists life in prison is punishment enough. A sentence that punishes his sorrow for what he did to Gabriel, but also shows compassion to his family. <coughs> is true justice in this case. These words coming moments after the prosecution's searing arguments for the death penalty. No human with a heart and soul could do that to an innocent little boy, and no human with any goodness in them can do that to a helpless little child. The prosecution once again showing the court graphic pictures of Gabriel's injuries. Sarah Geary punched Gabriel so hard that the skin came detached from his cheek, from his chin. From his mouth. And reminding jurors of the last violent day of Gabriel's life. It's another day where nobody saved Gabriel. It was another day where nobody heard Gabriel's cries or Gabriel's screams, with the exception of the defendant. We, the jury in the above entitled action, having found the defendant, Isaro Aguirre, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree, and having found the special circumstance to be true, fix the penalty at death. The mother at the center of one of the most horrific child abuse cases in L.A. County has cut a deal with prosecutors. Is that correct, Defendant Pearl Fernandez? Yes. And with that soft yes, 34-year-old Pearl Fernandez, the mother of 8-year-old Gabriel Fernandez, pleaded guilty, guilty to willfully and knowingly killing her son and torturing him. Do you fully understand the plea? Yes. By pleading guilty and not having a trial, Ms. Fernandez will not face the death penalty. Her plea agreement stipulates that she will never file an appeal and she will spend the rest of her life in state prison. No chance at all of parole. I knew in my heart that she was doing what he said she was doing. Jennifer Garcia, Gabriel's second grade teacher, recalling a parent-teacher conversation she had with Pearl Fernandez in the fall of 2013. We're talking about, you know, his reading level or something or, you know, his report card. And she said, because I don't hit my kids. And she said, because I don't hit my kids, I make them do exercises. But the evidence does show, and now Ms. Fernandez admits it, she did hit Gabriel over and over again. You just keep your voice up so everybody can hear you. All right. All right. They've never known my son, and they just want some pain on 
sentences in the course of those 20 years and, and generally it is my practice not to comment on a lot of cases but you know I was privy to this case I sat through it and I heard the evidence uh, I was privy to the photographs coroner's photographs the extent of the injuries and what have you and this almost demands that comment be made uh, about this case it goes without saying that uh, the conduct was horrendous and humane and nothing short of evil uh, the repeated beatings, burning, starving, binding, uh, shooting Gabriel with uh, BBs that were embedded in different parts of his body, knocking his teeth out with a bat, uh, locking him in a dark cabinet while he's bound, and starving this, this poor child. I, I, it is unimaginable the pain that this child probably endured. And uh, from what I heard, Gabriel was a, a kind, loving individual who just wanted to be loved. And so, uh, uh, you know, you want to say that the conduct was animalistic, but that would be wrong. Because even animals know how to take care of their young. Some to an extent that they will sacrifice their own lives uh, in caring for their young. Um, I, I remember seeing years ago a report on the news that, that uh, and this at least sent the point home to me about animals. And there was this cat who had given birth to a litter of cats and the house wherein the kittens were in um, was on fire. And that's what I think it made the news, because the fire department uh, was trying to put the fire out, but each time the mother went in to retrieve uh, a kitten, and she would emerge from the house uh, by the scruff, uh, holding the kitten by the scruff, uh, and, and uh, would manage one by one to, to bring him uh, or her to safety. And the last time, uh, the house was lost, and the fire department tried to keep this this cat from going into the house, but it managed to elude them, went into the house, and they thought, well, she's lost. And uh, I never forgot thinking that she, she made it out of the house. She had the cat by the scruff, except that she was singed and burning her face. But the, the thing that really struck me was the cat was not blind. The intensity of the heat burned her eyes, but she never let go of that kitten. And so when you want to say, first instinct is to say, you know what, this is animalistic. No, it's, it's beyond animalistic, because animals know how to take care of their young. You know, I can only wish, I, I really do, that you both, in the middle of the night, you wake up and you think of the injuries that, that you subjected this poor young man, this poor seven-year-old, um, and that it tortures you. I rarely say that. I rarely say that. It'll be a different type of torture, because you won't be in pain, physical pain. But I'm not capable, I'm not sure that you're capable of doing that. Um, but that's my wish. Spend all your time waiting For that second chance For a break that would make it okay There's always some reason To feel not and it's hard at the end of the day I need some distraction Oh, beautiful release Memories seep from my veins Let me be empty By a weightless And maybe I'll find some peace
And everywhere you turn There's vultures and thieves at your back The storm keeps on twisting Keep on building lies That you make up for all that you lack It don't make no difference Escape one last time It's easier to believe In this sweet madness All this glorious sadness Stop